this is uh, lecture four, four, and again, right? I think it's four. Okay. So, so, so we've been looking at preliminaries. Okay. So that's what we saw for pretty much all the lectures uh, uh, last uh, last three classes. And I think I have to keep my microphone. Okay, all right. So this seems to be much louder. Uh, so, so the last thing we saw was uh, discrete time signal processing. Okay, so that's what that's what we're going to do this class. Okay, so we'll be looking at. So this is this will be my notation for discrete time signals. I'll denote discrete time signals with x uh, square bracket n okay and we'll we'll let n be an integer index going from minus infinity to infinity okay so basically uh, x of n will be a sequence of complex numbers okay possibly a sequence of complex numbers and like like the continuous time case we'll be mostly concerned with uh, finite energy sequences okay so we'll be only worried about finite energy sequences in some cases we will look at uh, bounded sequences but typically only finite energy sequences okay so what what does uh, finite energy sequence mean okay in the discrete time case summation from over all n modulus of x of n squared should be finite okay so that that gives me finite energy sequences I'll, I'll only be worried about these kind of sequences okay so so many of these i think you must be familiar with quite a few of these things uh, that i'm going to talk about so we'll go through once again a little bit fast the um the first thing that i'm going to point out is discrete time convolution okay it's got a very similar notation to the continuous time case so i'll use a slight abuse of notation and call y of n the convolution of x of n and h of n okay i have to be very careful here with the notation because the way i write it down i'm going to say some summed over all m x m h n minus m okay you can also do it the other way you can also write h m x n minus m and that's discrete time convolution for you okay so where is convolution uh, relevant when when you look at linear time invariant systems in discrete time you can again show the output is the input sequence convolved with the impulse response sequence hfm okay so there will be two transforms that we'll be dealing with in the discrete time case one is what i would call dtft what is dtft discrete time fourier transform and the other is uh, what's called the z transform okay so i'll denote that zt Okay, so we'll be worried about both these transforms for h of n. Okay, so the definitions are quite easy. Okay, the discrete time Fourier transform is denoted e power j omega. Even before I go further, okay, this so this just this notation means a lot of things. Okay, why can't I just write x of omega? Why am I writing e power j omega? What's the big deal? Just by writing x of e power j omega, what does what does it imply on this function? I'm sorry. Oh well, you're going to going to the z transform. Even just just as function, instead of writing x of omega, if I write a function of x of e power j omega, what does it mean? Everything should be in terms of e power j omega. So what does it mean? Okay, in particular, e power j omega is a specific kind of function. It has a lot of properties. For instance, it's periodic in omega with period 2 pi. So whatever I do to this function, what will it be? It will also be periodic with period 2 pi. Just by denoting it like this, I am reminding myself every time. I can as well write it as x of omega and think of it as periodic in 2 pi. There is no problem in that. But I am reminding myself every time when I write like this that I know for sure that my function has to be periodic with period 2 pi. Okay, So that is one of the main things that comes out in this discrete time Fourier transform. So typically people worry, worry about only a 2 pi interval in omega. Okay, So 0 to 2 pi or minus pi to pi. 
depending on any, any 2 pi is fine, right? It's going to be periodic as long as you know where your high frequencies and low frequencies are, it's fine. Okay, so minus pi to pi is a typical interval that we might also take. Okay, so x of e pi j omega, just the way it's defined is you sum over all n x n e power minus j n omega. Right, so it's a simple. Once again, it's a it's a series summation. Right, it's not anything more than that. There are some convergence properties and all that. So if you you can show. Uh, a lot of useful uh, properties based on that okay and a uh, couple of things to note here so this omega is actually a dimensionless frequency parameter okay so we think of it as frequency but it doesn't matter it's just an just a notation right it's just a variable omega okay so it's it's typically dimensionless in physical systems we think of it as frequency times the sampling interval okay so that's how you think about it so omega would be 2 pi f t okay capital t where t is the sampling time that you took from the continuous time sequence. So that's, that's to go back to the physical nature of these signals. But if you don't care about it, just as sequences, this is a very well defined operation. You can just simply take summation x of n e power minus j and omega. There's no problem. As long as you have a sequence, you will get a function of omega out and you can study convergence and all that. Okay. So assuming convergence holds in a certain way, you also have a inverse relationship. Xn would be, you need a 1 by 2 pi here okay integral so i'm going to take minus pi to pi you might as well substitute this with any interval of length 2 pi okay x of e power j omega e power j n omega d omega okay so this is a this is quite a fancy integral okay so if you're not if you're not familiar with uh, complex integrals it, it can be misleading okay but you learn enough theory in dsp to do a lot of uh, conversions without really knowing anything about complex valued integrals right so you learn enough about who some sequences are and then you learn a lot of properties of this so that you can quickly do transformations without worrying about all kinds of properties of the integrals okay once in a while it will fail you but mostly it's okay as long as you deal with finite energy signals that's good enough and that's good enough for us as well okay so that's about the dtft okay the c transform is a similar definition but it's a little bit more general and more powerful minus n free to infinity xn z pa minus n where z is another complex number okay so it's a variable that denotes any complex number okay so you can see this is the generalization of the dtft right so like he pointed out you can take the z transform and look at it only on the complex number z with magnitude 1 so z pa, e pa j omega becomes set of all complex numbers with magnitude 1 right the unit circle as you call it okay so on that if you look at it you get dtft so it makes sense now the periodicity also makes sense right as you keep changing omega Obviously, you're going to come back over and over again to the same point. Okay, but the, the variable z, I'm sure you must have seen a lot of physical motivation for what the complex frequency stands for, what the real part is, what the imaginary part is, what this means, what that means, and all that. Okay, so so all those things, uh, I'm assuming you you have enough intuition about. We'll use all those things once in a while. Okay, so. So the thing that will be an object that we'll look at quite frequently in discrete time is the is the LTI system, okay? LTI system or linear filter, okay? So I'll just call a filter for instance, okay? Will always be linear for us, okay? It's characterized by, okay? Typically the impulse response, or I might replace this with what? One of two quantities. It can either be the discrete time Fourier transform whenever it exists, or H of Z whenever it is. Okay. So one thing to worry about in H of Z is what? There's one more thing you have to specify. Just that that X of Z you can show for most cases will converge. In fact, it will converge all the time, but in a certain range of values for Z. Okay. So in many cases that will be a, a ring, right? Uh, outside of a circle, inside of a circle, between two circles. Okay. That's how the region of convergence will be. So it will be typically specified. Okay. So the ROC also is very very important for x of z okay once you specify both you can go back to x of n as well okay so that once again there you you know a whole bunch of uh, z transform pairs and you can go from any relevant one back to the z transform in the other. okay so i'm not talking much about the roc here once in a while i'll use use those notions so if, if you've forgotten what the roc is go back and read its definition figure out how to find rocs and all that okay at least for the rational case it's very quite easy to figure out what the roc is Okay, and uh, and couple of uh, notions for this H of n that we'll be worried about 
is uh, okay. So I think some names are also important. I'll probably call this frequency response. Okay, this guy will be frequency response, and h of z will probably be transfer function. Okay, so those are uh, names from system theory that we will use as well. All right, so 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 so. so well, from a, from an implementation point of view, you would typically want this h of n to be causal and stable. Okay, causal means what? It's zero for n negative. Okay, so but that's too restrictive. That too in digital, it's really really restrictive because you can store stuff, right? So it doesn't make sense to restrict yourself to causal sequences. Okay, so tip, we'll, we'll restrict ourselves to what are called right-sided sequences, as in h of n will go to zero eventually, some at some point in time and and then for negative indices. So what can you do? How will you implement this, such filters in practice? Simply delay, right? So you shift it to the right or delay as long as you want and then implement it, implement a causal version of it. So what can happen eventually? What is the only difference? What can happen to your input sequence? Can, can it change drastically? Right? Not, you know, just a delay. Okay? So you delay your output also. You wait, wait for a little bit longer. You will get the exact response that you want. It's all LTI system. So it doesn't matter. You can shift in time. Then as long as you wait long enough, you'll get it. Okay, so with the, at that cost, we will say we'll consider in general h of n to be a right-sided sequence. What's the rigorous definition? H of n is zero for n less than or equal to m. Typically, we think of m as negative. That's fine. I mean, I'll just give a general definition for us for some integer m. Okay, so so there are some restrictions on the region of convergence for instance if you have causal sequences the region of convergence you can show will be a, a region outside of a certain circle okay all the way up to infinity if you have right sided sequences you cannot include infinity okay so that's the only thing there's no other problem okay you take the largest pole then everything outside of it will be a region of convergence so if in particular all your poles are inside the unit circle what can you say your sequence is going to be stable as well Okay, bounded input, bounded bounded output stable, stability. Your transfer function will be stable. Impulse response is stable. Okay, so we'll we'll mostly be interested in uh, causal and stable. Okay, causal interpret causal as right sided. Okay, so when I say causal, right, once in a while I'll, I'll interpret it as right sided, but typically we'll sometimes say causal as well. So when I say okay, let me go back and remove this. I don't want to say causal as right sided. Let me, let me take cause more confusion and unnecessary okay right sided and stable filters is what we'll be interested in okay what do i mean by stable okay so this bounded input bounded output stability there are various ways of defining it and time domain is defined as what should this be basically finite energy right so this should be less than infinity or how will you define it in uh, z transform domain all poles should be inside the unit circle or the region of convergence should contain the unit circle so that h of e power j omega is defined okay so in terms of the frequency response once the frequency response is defined you know it is it's going to be stable okay so that's how you go about defining it okay so all those things uh, are important once in a while we'll also be worried about minimum phase what's minimum phase minimum phase is all poles and zeros of the uh, of h of z are inside the unit circle. Okay, so there are various interpretations for minimum phase. One of the interpretations is what? The, the inverse will also be stable, right? Is that fine? So the inverse will also be stable. Okay, so poles and zeros are. Uh, minimum phase so when you think of doing an inverse you will also get poles and zeros to be inside the unit circle inverse will also be stable okay so there's also a notion of monic i just want to write it down here i don't want to go to a new page here what's monic okay monic and causal okay what's monic and causal what is monic okay causal means h of 0 is where you start okay h of 0 h of 1 etc and h of 0 equal to 1 makes it monic okay so that's the thing okay so that's the definition for being monic 
the leading parameter, uh, leading coefficient is 1. Okay, so that's the definition. Okay, so I think it's pretty much everything I wanted to do. It's probably reminded you of. Yeah, the re reason will be, see, usually when you, uh, when you talk of existence of certain filters, existence will be guaranteed only up to scaling. So you can multiply with some number and you'll still get another signal. So when you talk about, want to talk about the unique something, you always say monic, just to make it unique. It just helps in specifying, making it, making things uh, unique. So if, if, for instance, I have a filter with a certain frequency response, if I scale it with any number, I'll still get another filter, frequency, same frequency. So if you want to specify one filter, you say, okay, I take the monic version, then it will be. Okay, so yeah, it's use, used usually for uh, for that purpose. It's not it's not very important, but sometimes it makes makes a difference. Okay, so the next thing is uh, we'll be worried about is the folded spectrum. Okay, so this is quite important. Okay, very often we'll be sampling continuous time signals, and you should have a very clear understanding of how the spectrum translates. Okay, so I have a continuous time signal with a certain spectrum. What will be the DTFT of the sampled version? Okay, so that's where the folded spectrum notion comes in. Okay, so here's where we start. We say signal Q of T is Fourier transform pair with frequency response QF. Okay, and then I go ahead and sample this. What do I do when I sample this? I define a sequence QN as Q at these time instances, N T. Okay, T is my sampling time or my sampling frequency is what? 1 by T samples per second. Okay, so that's my unit. Okay, so one can show if you do this, Q of n's DTFT, okay, will be what? Okay, I'll define that as Q tilde e power j. Watch out for what I'm going to do next. Be very careful about where this omega comes from. I'll relate omega to all these other quantities as well. Okay, Q tilde of e power j omega. This will work out to what? 1 by t summation m equals minus infinity to infinity q f minus m over t okay so this is called folding or aliasing is also another word that people use to describe this so you take q of f okay then shift it by 1 by t then add up everything together and then you divide by the 1 by t the final division by 1 by t is not so crucial doesn't change too many things but the shape of the spectrum is decided by summation okay so that aliasing is very very important so to go back to the discrete continuous time case and relate everything and keep everything together, you have to think of omega as what? 2 pi f t, okay, where f is my continuous frequency. Okay, so if you if you're really worried about mapping everything back to the continuous time domain, your continuous frequency and discrete time frequency are related like this. Okay, or if you want, you can write it as 2 pi f over f s. Okay, so this f over f s is the it's kind of a normalized frequency in the discrete time domain. Okay, so we'll we'll usually deal with this uh, all the time. Okay, all right. So so you notice one thing. This guy is what? This guy is periodic with period one by t. Okay, in 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 uh, in f. Okay, so that results in the periodicity for q of e pi j omega as well. Okay, so that's something that we wanted, and that's happening. All right. So if you if you don't want any aliasing and if you want your Q tilde of e pi j omega to contain an accurate copy of Q of f, what should happen necessarily? Q of f should vanish within within this 1 by t, well 1 by 2 t, right? So you need 1 by t to be greater than. So it's called the no aliasing condition. You have to sample fast enough, right? So 1 by t has to be greater than greater than 2 times the bandwidth of q of t okay so you always think of q of t as a base band signal okay so you define the bandwidth as the largest positive frequency that it has and if you as long as you sample 2 times above that you get it okay there's also a notion of band pass sampling okay so it's also possible to do band pass sampling so so this q, q of t need not necessarily be a base band signal as long as it occupies a small enough band in any frequency you can sample it at a carefully chosen rate, which is an integer multiple of somewhere in the middle, so that when it aliases, you will get a baseband copy, which is exactly what it was in the past, past band. Okay, so it's very easy to do that as well. I'm hoping you, you would have read that. So, but it's not too relevant for us, but it's an interesting thing to think about. This aliasing shifts it 
all the way, right? So even if it is somewhere else, as long as you make sure this m by t is such that something will come in the baseband properly, you can you can sample directly. Okay, as, but you have to filter carefully in that band and then sample. Then if you low pass filter it or if your bandwidth itself is small enough, you will get automatically the sampled version. Okay, so that's band pass sampling. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but you should know that it exists. Okay. So another thing that I wanted to talk about here is spectrum for spectral factorization, but I don't think this is a good point to introduce it. I'll introduce it later when we need it. Okay, so if you want to read about it, you can read about it. It's not it's not terribly difficult, but we, I'll do it later when we need it. Okay, so I think that way it will stay fresher in your mind. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to do for discrete time signals. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll mostly be dealing with discrete time signals in this course. So if you're not sure about DTFT, what it what it means, some transform pairs. It's a good this, now is a good time to go and read it. Okay, so I'll ask questions in quizzes and exams, assuming you know how to find DTFT, how to find Z transform, how to find Fourier transform, and all that. Okay, so that's the reason why I'm giving all this notation. You can't come back and quiz and tell me I don't know how to find the DTFT of this. Okay, so you better be uh, prepared for that. Okay, all right. So next thing next thing we need the last bit is what what you must have seen very recently which is in 356 is random signals so probability and random variables and random processes okay so i'll go through it a little bit fast pausing only for the very important things let's see how it works out. okay so couple of things about the way i lecture i've been told several times that i go very very fast okay is that true true or false not true okay so there's one surefire way of slowing me down that is to keep asking questions Okay, so if you don't interrupt me and ask questions, I'll just keep on going. And once the momentum gathers, it's tough to stop. Okay, so whenever you think it's going too fast, I'm not able to catch something. It's perfectly okay to just put your hand up and say, "Can you can you repeat something?" Yeah, okay, I won't I won't be distressed or upset or anything. Just tell me. Okay, I might penalize you later, but that's okay. Okay, all right. So so first thing before you study random signals is the notion of probability and random variables. Okay. Okay, many students tend to retain their high school notion of probability and random variables and never really learn the uh, the real graduate school version. We, we try to do some kind of a job in 356, but it's also still uh, confusing. Okay, so if at all you learn probability and random variables properly in the rigorous way, you'll realize how much more there is to it than what I'm going to describe now. Okay, so what we're doing is just a simple version just to enable calculation, not the real rigorous theory. Okay, so the notions that I'll expect you to be very comfortable with initially in probability is sample space and all that. Okay, sample space events, what are events, how you define them, how to calculate probabilities for events given a probability measure on your sample space, all those things. I'm not even going to write down. Okay, so I think you've, you've been reading it for a long time in your life, so I'll expect that you know that. Okay, the next thing when that for technical reasons, what we need is first thing we need is notion of random variables. Okay, how do you define a random variable? What is a random variable? Function from to the real line, right? So it cannot be any old function. There are some very rigorous restrictions on what that function can be, but we'll take it to be a function from sample space to the real line. Okay, for us, most of the in most cases, we'll be dealing with a sample space which is also a real line. Okay, so we'll just talk about the random variable as it is without worrying about the sample space okay in that case you have to think of the sample space also as the real line and some events are being defined around around that real line so i'll say my event is my random variable lies between 3 and 4 okay so that's an event okay so that's how i'll define events okay so that you should be comfortable with to to properly do computations with random variables there are two associated functions the first function which always exists is what the way the random variable defined, it's guaranteed to exist for any random variable. What is that? The cumulative distribution function. Okay, so that always exists. There's no problem. One can always talk about it. Okay, it has some properties. It starts at zero. It's right continuous, and it will end at one. Okay, so you know that for sure. Okay, to further facilitate calculations in several cases, one can define what's called a probability density function, and it will once again exist for most cases that we'll be dealing with. Okay, in case in cases it, where it doesn't exist, we'll use the delta functions once in a while and make make sure we study all random variables together in one big bunch, which has a nice PDF defined. Okay, there's also a PMF that I'll talk about for the discrete time case. Okay, so what is PMF? Probability mass function. Okay, so that's uh, PDF is probability density function. Okay, 
So there are several calculations you have to do around these PDFs. For instance, if I give you an event as random variable lying between 3 and 4, how will you find it using the PDF? You integrate the PDF from 3 to 4, how will you find it with the CDF? CDF evaluated at 4 minus CDF evaluated at 3. Okay, so there are some intricacies if there is a jump at 3 or 4 or somewhere in the middle. Okay, so that those cases we won't worry too much about. We'll just say we'll deal with it when we come there. Okay, so it's not a big deal. Okay, other things that one needs to be very careful about with random variables is mean and expectation. Okay, so you should know how to compute mean or expectation. Okay, so this expectation operator is more general, right? Expected value of any function of the random variable, you should know how to compute. Okay, so you just put it inside the integral and multiply with the PDF and figure it out. Okay, mean is a specific case which is expected value of the random variable itself. Okay, typically I'll use num numbers like uh, variables like x and y to denote random variables. Then variance is another thing we'll worry about. Variance is what? Expected value of square minus mean squared. Okay, so that's the variance and variance you can show will always be positive. Okay square root of the variance is a standard deviation so all those things are there okay so that's as far as one random variable is concerned when you go to multiple random variables i'll expect you to know what a joint pdf is okay joint pdf joint pmf how to find the marginals from it how to evaluate probabilities with joint pdf which is always more complicated than single pdf okay so once you have more than one it's always complicated and when you go to really more than two or three it's useful to think of vectors of random variables Okay, or random vectors. Okay. Okay, and uh, in this case, there'll be a lot of things which will become vectors and matrices. For instance, the mean will become a vector of means. Okay, and what about variance? Yeah, it'll become a covariance matrix, right? So that's something which you should deal with when it comes to vectors. Okay, so other things, another thing that I'll worry about is conditional probability. Okay, this will play a very important role. So I'll maybe spend some time with conditional probability. Okay, and things like Bayes rule will play a very, very important role. Okay, so there are several uh, things to pay attention to when you look at continuous prob con conditional probability. Depending on whether you're dealing with the discre uh, discrete random variable or a continuous random variable, all these things, we, we define conditional probability very differently, right? In some cases, when, this, when you're conditioning on a continuous random variable, what will happen? You'll have to go to the PDF and then look at its evaluation, all those things. So we do all that because <coughs> we're limited by the theory. So if, you, if at all you learn the theory properly, there is a proper unified way to define everything, which takes care of the whole thing. Okay, so but for us, we'll do deal with discrete and continuous separately. Okay, and there are also two different notions. Okay, one is conditioning on an event. Okay, probability of something given conditioned on an event. And there's also another notion of conditioning on a random variable, right? You condition on a random variable being equal to some value. Okay, so both those things are sometimes related, sometimes not related, depending on uh, whether you're working in discrete or continuous uh, time. And I'll expect you to be comfortable doing all those computations. Okay, and uh, we will do this a lot. We will do a lot of conditional probability calculations involving both discrete variables and continuous variables, conditioning on the conditional variable, conditioning on the discrete variable. We'll do all kinds of things. I'll keep writing down the formula and you, you most, in most cases you'll agree. Sometimes in an exam when you have to recreate, when you have to recreate it, all these basic confusions will come. Okay, so make sure you know how to do these computations. Okay, another thing we'll define is uh, conditional PDF, which is again another thing, reasonably complicated. Conditional PDF. Okay, so again I'll do it for the uh, for the continuous time case. In the continuous case, the discrete case is not too bad. Okay. So this will be my notation when I write down, okay, so I, all the notation is nicely captured here. So that's why I'm doing this. Okay, X and Y are random variables which are jointly, uh, they, they have a joint uh, PDF, they're jointly distributed. The con conditional distribution of X given Y is defined as the joint PDF of XY divided by the marginal of Y whenever the marginal is non-zero okay so you only have to only have to look at those points where the marginal of y is non-zero so you see all the notation is nicely captured in this formula okay so how will i denote pdf of a single random variable i'll write f random variable as subscript and 
a dummy variable running okay so if i see any other notation which is fancy i will i will not consider that as valid okay so please stick to this notation particularly in this course this notation can save you okay so there's lots of things that we'll be dealing with if you're not very careful you will get totally misled by notation okay in the join pdf what am i going how am i going to denote it i'm going to put all the variables that i have to keep track of in the subscript and a dummy variable for each what am i doing for the conditional pdf okay x given y then x given y again 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 a dummy variable so what does it mean conditioned on y taking the value small y what's my pdf of x okay in the join distribution okay you can show all these things are consistent uh, if you carefully define it okay if one of these things become discrete what should you do in general as a rule you simply replace wherever you have pdf with the probability okay so that will work in general okay but sometimes you have to pay attention to how you are actually defining the defining the notion okay all right so that's about the basics of uh, random variables so one random variable which we will deal with all the time is the gaussian random variable okay sometimes i'll call this normal okay so we'll say x is normal distributed with mean mu and variance sigma square this means that the pdf is 1 by root 2 pi sigma e power minus x minus mu squared by 2 sigma square okay for what value of x for all x okay so this is a random variable that allows its allow that's allowed to take values over the entire region of x okay so so you should know this formula even at midnight okay if somebody wakes you up from sleep wake up you should know this formula okay so this is one formula you cannot do without wherever whichever field you go to okay doesn't matter if you want to get out of electrical engineering as soon as you pass out you should know this formula okay this will play a big role in your life okay if at all you are anywhere near computation all right so that's the normal uh, distribution in several cases we'll deal with the standard normal distribution which is just 0 1 okay so this is a re really simple formula here you would get 1 by root 2 pi e power minus x squared by 2 okay so so i remember there was a student i don't know if he actually is in this class right now he came and spoke to me that he doesn't have the prerequisite but he wants to do the course what is the only question i asked him what do you think is the question i asked him what is the gaussian random variable okay he keeps saying this things like this bell shaped he didn't get through okay at least i i didn't give him i didn't tell him that he can join but is he here i don't know i don't think he is here i can't recognize him anyway so all that is not good okay the gaussian random variable has a precise definition it is that random variable which has this pdf there is no other gaussian random variable okay don't don't be under any such illusions okay so useful exercise if you have never done this before is to show first of all that this is a valid pdf how will you show that it's a valid pdf okay how many of you know how to do this okay okay some ways of doing it if you don't know it's a good thing to get to know okay so there's a way of converting into a 2d integral which will nicely simplify into a doable one okay so otherwise it becomes difficult okay so you can show for the gaussian random variable x defined this way expected value of x is what mu okay so this, this doesn't seem like a terribly difficult integral to do an integral that might be more difficult is to show expected value of x squared what will this work out to mu squared plus sigma squared okay so this might be slightly more difficult if you're not used to it okay so there is there is there are standard tricks to do these kind of integrals with the gaussian okay i'm assuming you're familiar with it if you're not you better pick up a book and be familiar with it because i might expect you to do such integrals okay so you should be they are very basic and simple but you should know how to do it okay so one integral you cannot do very easily is the cdf for this okay so it doesn't have a closed form so we'll define a function it's possible to define what's called error function it's complement to define the cdf that's what statisticians do usually but in this course we'll define what's called a q function okay so the q function evaluated at x i'll define as integral from x to infinity 1 by root 2 pi e power minus t squared by 2 dt okay this will be my q function you can write the cdf very easily in terms of this okay so it's not a big deal so we'll use the q function it's the, it calculates what's called the tail probability probability that capital x is greater than or equal to small x okay so this is what calculates 
Okay, so that's the Q function, and uh, okay, so this is this x. Okay, sorry. Okay, so you can go back and forth between mean mu variance sigma square and mean zero and variance one. How do you do that? If you do x minus mu my sigma, the uh, Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma square becomes the normal Gaussian. So once you make a normal Gaussian, you do all the calculation here with Q and then go back to what whatever you want. Okay, that's a trick. And this Q function falls very rapidly. You can show, you can show, you can show. Where's my approximations for Q? Yeah, Q function goes uh, very rapidly. In fact, a good upper bound for all cases is this half. half e power minus x squared by 2 this is a good uh, approximation or you, you also have an approximation which is valid for slightly larger values which is once again very useful okay so these are all these two are actually good approximations for q itself okay so you can in cases where you have to evaluate an integral involving q and you want to quickly get, get to an answer without worrying about exact nature of q you can plug in these guys and get some pretty good results very 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 nice results can be obtained for this okay there's also a lower bound which is closely related I'll, I'll allow you to look it up okay so that's about the q the next uh, thing you may which which i'm sure none of you will remember by heart is the joint gaussian distribution okay so this is once again will be very useful to us we'll say two variables x and y are jointly gaussian Okay, if the joint PDF is, okay, so it's a crazy formula. I don't expect you to really remember it, but it's good to know that there is a formula. Okay, e power minus x squared minus 2 rho xy plus y squared by 2 sigma squared 1 minus rho squared. Okay, once again, all x and all y. This rho, well, uh, this is actually a specific case. It's a more general case where x and y could have different means and different variances. I've taken a very specific case where x and y have means 0 and both have individually variances sigma square. Okay, you can show that if this is the joint PDF, the individual distribution is what? x is normal with mean 0, variance sigma square. y is normal with mean 0 and variance sigma square. And this together they have they are related by this joint PDF. They are not independent. Okay, so if they are independent, the formula will look different. Okay, this is, this is a, together they are related by this joint PDF, which is different from the independent version, and it's characterized by what's called this correlation coefficient rho, which can be defined as expected value of x y divided by sigma square. Okay, so this is pretty much the most general version we'll need. Okay, so any change you can make very easily, right? So what will happen if I want a different mean for x? You would put x minus mu and all that. So in fact, you can even set sigma square to 1 and define a simple case and then do transformations to deal with other cases. Okay. So this is the jointly Gaussian uh, PDF. This rho is the correlation coefficient. So if rho is 0, okay, actually it's you should say x and y are uncorrelated, but in the Gaussian case, it will turn out they are independent as well. Okay, so those are uh, nice things about the Gaussian. Okay. All right, so so you, you also have a vector of random variables which are jointly Gaussian. Okay, so you, here you had two in general. You might have n random variables. Once again, I'll put a transpose here. Each xi is normal, say, okay, so I should say, I shouldn't put equal to. Okay, so once again, the general distribution, general joint PDF is fairly complex okay so we'll we'll take we'll take uh, we'll take first a simple case i'll introduce the way the pdf is written down and then i'll write the more general case okay so this is this is x1 through xn being jointly gaussian but each guy is so this is the iid case okay so i should say what this is this is the iid case what is iid independent and identically distributed so each xi is normal with mean 0 and variance 1 okay and it is independent Okay, so in this case, what can you do for the joint PDF? Multiply all the marginals, right? So if you want to write down, you can nicely write fx xs. Okay, you just multiply the individual ones, it will turn out to be a very simple formula. So I'll just write down the actual formula here. N over 2 e power minus 2 sigma square. 
So what's this norm x squared? It's the two norm. Okay, so summation x i squared. Okay, so I should put a bar here. All right. So that's the that's the joint PDF. It's simply the product of the individual normal PDFs. It's no big deal. Okay. So the more general case, a little bit more twisted. You need a few more definitions. This is the general case, not the IID case. You need the mean first. The mean would be vector of these guys expected values and then you also need what's called the covariance matrix covariance matrix is expected value of x minus m remember x minus m is a column vector i'm going to multiply with x minus m transpose which would be a row vector what would be column vector times a row vector you will get a square matrix right the same vector transpose you'll get a square matrix and the expected op value operator should operate on each element of the matrix Okay, so each the C i j th term of C i will look like what? What will it be? Expected value of x i minus m i times x j minus m j. Okay, so that's how the i j th value will look. Okay, so once you have all this, and once I'm going to further assume that C is an invertible matrix. Okay, so you might say, why do you want to assume C is an invertible matrix? Seems like a very artificial assumption. It just simplifies my uh, things. Okay, so if we assume C is an inverted mat invertible matrix, you can write down the joint PDF very nicely. Okay, so 1 by 2 pi raised to the power n by 2. So this modulus for the matrix is the determinant. Okay, raised to the power half, e power minus half, x minus m transpose. C inverse x minus m. Okay. All right. So the numerator will be what's called a quadratic form in general. So it will have terms like xi, xj. Okay. All those terms will appear. Xi squared, xi some constant times xj. All those terms, and you'll have a constant. Those kind of terms will appear in this uh, in the exponential. Okay, so that's the jointly Gaussian distribution. Okay, so a standard question that's asked in several interviews from people is, do you know what the joint Gaussian distribution is? People will give this C inverse formula, and people's the first question, next question is what? What if C is not invertible? Can you define jointly Gaussian in that case? Okay, so so it turns out the proper way of defining jointly Gaussian is something else. Okay, and that is what? What is the proper way of defining jointly Gaussian random variables? Okay, the way you define it is saying every linear combination, every set of linear combination should be jointly Gaussian again. Okay, so that's how we kind of define it. Uh, well, that's that's a property that turns out to be true. But actually, when you define it, you define a set of random variables to be jointly Gaussian if every linear combination is Gaussian. Okay, so that's the that's the condition. Okay, so but that's the general definition that works whether or not the covariance matrix is invertible or not. So from there, you can go to a set of random variables for which the covariance matrix will be invertible and then you can define the distribution okay everything else will be nicely defined okay so that property i want to highlight it's very very important for us okay uh, linear combinations of of jointly gaussian random variables are once again what are jointly Gaussian. Okay, so this is a crucial property. It will simplify all kinds of computations for us. Okay, so the keywords here are linear combinations and jointly Gaussian. You take a jointly Gaussian set of random variables, take whatever number of linear combinations you want, you once again get a jointly Gaussian set. Okay, so that's very, very important. Okay, so this is a very key property. If you didn't have this property, so many computations that you do routinely will tend tend to get ultimately ugly. So you see why people really like jointly Gaussian random variables, right? So we like linearity. We would like to do linear combinations of inputs in every filter that we have. We would like to do that. And whenever we have uncertainty, we want to assume Gaussian because then I know my LTI system will do nothing to the distribution. If it's jointly Gaussian, it will once again spit out jointly Gaussian random variables at the output. Okay. So that's very uh, useful. It's also possible to do so many other definitions. Okay, so that's that's pretty much 
all I want to do about jointly Gaussian random variables. Okay, so the next thing I'll quickly define and then we'll start to characterize this further in the next class, next five minutes is random process. Okay. Okay, so we'll distinguish between two different cases here, random processes in discrete time and random processes in continuous time. Okay, but I'm going to do both of them simultaneously and just to speed up the whole review. Okay, so I'm assuming you've seen all of this before in 356 at least. Okay, so I'm going to do this uh, in that way. So in discrete time and continuous time, okay, random process is nothing but I'll denote it xk. Okay, so it's a sequence of random variables. Okay, so each xk can be a continuous random variable. I don't care about that. When I say discrete time, what do I mean? Time is discrete. Okay, so I only have x1, x2, so on. I don't have x1, x1.001. I don't have things like that. Okay, it's only x1, x2, so on. That's discrete time for me. Okay, likewise in the continuous case, I'll denote by x of t, okay, a continuous time random process. What does it mean? For each t, x of t is a random variable. Once again, it can be discrete, it can be continuous, I don't care. Okay, so for each t, x of t is a random variable. Okay, so if you talk about talk with, talk about random process with uh, mathematicians and statisticians, statisticians, they'll be worried about a lot of things before they define something like this. Okay, so we'll not worry about such things. We'll just quickly say this is how we define it. Okay, so how do we specify a random process? There is the the proper way of specifying it is to specify all finite distributions, finite set distributions. If I give you a finite set of random variables from this infinite connection, you should give me a join PDF for that. Okay, so that's the way in which we'll define it. I'll call those finite distributions. These are used to specify random variables. Okay, join PDF of PDF or PMF. Okay. Of a finite collection of random variables from the process. Okay, so in the discrete time case, how will this work out? I have to give the joint PDF of x k1 k2 to kn for all n and ki. Okay, so this is what I have to do. Okay, in the continuous case. I have to give the joint PDF of x of t1, x of t2, x of tn for all n and ti. Okay, if I do that, I've specified my random process completely. Okay, so usually this is not how random processes in practice are specified. You specify them slightly differently through through another route, which is called the sample function route. Okay, so what you assume is the entire random process. Is, con is controlled by say one or two random variables. Based on some value the random variable takes, I define my entire random process. Okay, so I'll only give you an example of how that is done. I won't I won't go into the details because it's usually done with examples. Here's an example of a sample function definition. Okay, so I'll say my random process is defined as a k say for instance cos 2 pi f t plus theta. Okay, so maybe this is uh, a k f k. Okay, so maybe this is this is how I define it. So what will I say? I'll say my f k's are constants or random variables if you want. Theta is a constant or a random variable if you want. A k is a constant or a random variable if I want. Depending on what I make random variable, I have actually defined a, a random variable for each t. Okay, have I specified the joint PDF? I have also specified the random joint PDF. Okay, so based on this definition and the PDFs and the joint distributions of AK, FK, and theta for any set of TIs, you can compute the joint PDF. Okay, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's possible to compute it. Okay, so so that's that's another way of doing it. So the sample function route is what we will take usually. Okay, so you see it's also possible to mix up discrete and continuous and all that and come up with definitions. Okay, so this is the route we will take most often in defining random processes. Okay, so it's an indirect way of specifying the distributions. Alright, so I'll stop here and proceed with more definitions on random process in next class. You have to sign your attendance.